Hi, my name is Andrew Van Lint, and I'm going to be running through basic bloods, an introduction to the complete blood examination and some associated tests. So this complete blood examination is called a number of things, complete or full examination or count, they're all the same terms. So you might have a CBE or an FEE, FBE, a CBC or an FBC, they're all the same thing when it comes to um, the actual test results and they contain the same kind of measurements. So what is actually part of this is a haemoglobin check and red cell indices, a white cell count and a differential of the white cells, whether we look at the different white cells and their number and often their percentage, and then the platelet count. And often accompanying this is a film review, which is often done as an automatic part by the machine and may be checked by a medical scientist, in some cases either by request or by criteria, goes to a haematologist for review as well, and you'll sometimes see comments there. So let's go break this down into a bit more detail. The haemoglobin, or particularly the red cell indices, are talking about the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Why do we measure haemoglobin, which is the oxygen carrying globulin, rather than red cells? The real reason for that is that haemoglobin is the oxygen carrying part. And so the number of haemoglobin or the concentration is more significant than the actual number of red cells. If you have a lot of red cells, but not very much haemoglobin, that's not a really helpful kind of number. Likewise, if you don't have as much red cells, but they're packed with haemoglobin, that still could be as clinically significant as a normal count. So we count the, the haemoglobin, and we looked at a few other indices there. The red cell count doesn't make a big difference. The packed cell volume, significant for some conditions like polycythemia um, and haemochromatosis. Mean cell volume is a really important part. That's how we differentiate into microcytic, which is small cells, macrocytic being big cells, and normocytic being normal cell uh, range. So the volume of the cell there is what differentiates between those three groups. Mean cell haemoglobin is an actual number, and then you look at the key concentration, or MCHC is another really key characteristic that tells us about the chromicity. So is it hyperchromic, as in a lot of haemoglobin, hypochromic, as in not very much haemoglobin, or normochromic. And so you can actually summarize some of those numbers by saying this is, you know, if it's anemia, therefore the haemoglobin is low, and it's microcytic and it's hypochromic. And communicating that does communicate a particular likely set of differentials associated with that, namely iron deficiency. We also have red cell distribution width, which is often changed in inflammatory states. Moving on to the white cell count, normal white cell count for most people is about four to 12. When you're getting above that, you're looking at conditions that may be uh, inflammatory, infections, or even some malignancies. And when you're looking lower than that, you're gonna to start to think about other conditions, diseases that are suppressing bone marrow, medication suppressing bone marrow, or actual diseases of the bone marrow itself. It's broken up into neutrophil count, which is our main component of white cells. Lymphocytes, which are the next most common, which are B cells and T cells in particular. Monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils being the much smaller components of the white cells. So let's talk a little bit more about red cells. Again, the whole point of red cells is carrying oxygen. The haemoglobin itself is made up of four subunits, usually two alpha, which is in this picture is in red, and two beta, which are in blue. And you may have heard of thalassemia before, which is um, a really common form of haemoglobinopathy. And thalassemias, either alpha or beta, are related to genetic uh, disorders that produce less uh, amounts of alpha or beta haemoglobin or don't produce any of those at all and then they have to produce haemoglobin that is using other subunits which won't last as long and then within each of these subunits they hold one heme group and that's what binds to the oxygen. The reticulocyte count is a count of immature red cells and they are often elevated in anemia as a physiological reaction by the bone marrow so uh, for example you have a trauma uh, traumatic event or a, perhaps a gastrointestinal bleed, you suddenly drop your red cells and then your haemoglobin goes down. Your bone marrow will then you know, get the iron, B12, folate and other components to produce red cells at an increased rate. And as part of that, some of the immature cells spill out into the peripheral circulation from the bone marrow. They're reticulocytes and they're slightly larger than red cells. And so having an, an elevated reticulocyte count in the context of anemia is normal. And when it's inappropriately normal, in terms of the reticulocyte site count in the context of anemia, we think that something is impairing the bone marrow from producing its normal physiological reaction. So it's a really helpful thing in some instances. You'd be familiar with the different causes of anemia. Let's break them down into macrocytic, folate, B12, really common, um, alcohol itself. So a lot of people who have uh, are alcoholics or people that abuse alcohol regularly may also be malnourished. So they may actually have 
B12 or folate deficiency in addition, but alcohol itself does cause a macrocytosis. Um, prolonged liver disease can also cause a macrocytic anemia. And then medications, one of the most common one being a oral uh, immunosuppressant called azathioprine. If you're taking azathioprine, you usually have macrocytosis. It's a, actually a way to subtly measure whether a patient is actually taking their drugs or not. Reticulocytes can actually contribute to a macrocytosis. And if someone has a dysplasia of their bone marrow, which is usually an age-related phenomenon, they can often have macrocytes as well. Moving to the other end of the spectrum, microcytic anemia. Iron deficiency accounts for so many of these. And then inflammatory conditions, which is really the anemia of chronic disease, where you've often got impairment of uh, iron and other uh, building blocks of hemoglobin. Thalassemia, we've talked about before, um, which the actual subunits of the haemoglobin are not being produced in a normal either amount or quality. And then some particular um, e exposure to toxins, particularly lead poisoning and copper deficiency, both can contribute to microcytic. They're very rare though. So I think you really wanna be thinking about iron deficiency, um, anemic chronic disease, and, and, and thalassemia being your top three in this category. Normocytic, normal size, but you're still anemic. Acute blood loss will cause that, and ongoing blood loss will then go to iron deficiency, microcytic anemia. Um, and then hemolysis is the other one in this group. And often chronic disease will start in the normocytic and progress into microcytic territory. And hemolysis can be divided into those that are more of a mechanical shredding of cells, so microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, or MAHA, or those that are autoimmune mediated, which may be related to another autoimmune condition, or that may be the autoimmune disease itself. Um, and that's usually called AIHA, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And there's a few subsets if you're ever interested to look them up. Let's talk about iron studies. This isn't part of a, a complete blood examination, but for anyone that has microcytic anemia, this is really an essential next step in terms of uh, investigating that anemia. So within that, we've got the serum iron. Serum iron can change from time to time, so that's not really a very reliable marker of whether this person has uh, adequate iron supplies that could produce red cells. What's more useful is ferritin. Ferritin is a spherical protein that can hold up to 4,500 molecules of iron. It's a huge amount. And so that ferritin can be found in different organs in the body, the bone marrow, the liver, even some in the spleen and other tissues. And that's where the iron is stored after it's left um, the enterocytes at the brush border of the gastrointestinal tract. The, what we actually measure in the blood is called apoferritin. And typically, the amount of circulating ferritin correlates to the amount of ferritin in tissues that is actively storing iron. So we use iron as a surrogate marker to say how much iron is being stored in the body right now. And the ferritin generally does not change rapidly according to iron uh, stores. The other issue is that when you have an inflammatory state, the ferritin can rise as an acute phase reactant. And it's not rising because it's being filled with iron, it's rising because of the inflammation. So in those situations, you can be falsely reassured to say, this person has an elevated ferritin, but they may not actually be storing significant amounts of iron. Transferrin is the protein, somewhat like how albumin carries other products around the body. Transferrin is the transporter protein for iron that then carries it around to where the ferritin is in the tissue and deposits it there. And then it will also carry it then to the bone marrow where it can be utilized for hemoglobin production. The transferrin saturation is the proportion of the transferrin currently bound to iron. And so for myself as a training hematologist, the ferritin is telling me how much is being stored in the body and the transferrin saturation is telling me how much is being utilized in the body. So someone who has an inflammatory state may actually have the transferrin being impaired in terms of its transportation or some of the portals that allow the iron to leave cells being blocked. And in that situation, you'll see the transferrin saturation is low, even though the ferritin might be high or normal. In those situations, we often call that functional iron deficiency because they might have iron in the body, but it can't get to a point that's functional and therefore we need to replace with intravenous iron. If you were to have standard iron deficiency, you will generally find that the iron is low. Again, not a really reliable marker because that can change day to day. The ferritin is low. The transferrin is high, a way of the body trying to compensate for the low uh, iron by releasing more transferrin saying, go out and find me some more iron, bring it to the bone marrow and naturally the transferrin saturation will also be low. Let's talk about when you have too high hemoglobin or too high number of red cells. We call this polycythemia. Break it down, poly meaning many, cy meaning cells, and emia in the blood. So too many cells in the blood, 
What cells? Blood cells, red cells. So within this you can talk about primary and secondary causes. The primary cause is in a primary issue with the bone marrow itself is called polycythemia vera. This is where there's a mutation that's generally acquired, most commonly JAK2 if you're ever interested in looking that up, that then drives the bone marrow to produce a higher than physiologically required number of red cells, in particular haemoglobin. And that can be problematic because those cells can then slow down blood flow and cause clots. It's not actually good for the person and we need to treat that. And really beyond that, every other condition is usually a secondary uh, trigger that is driving the bone marrow to produce uh, more red cells. So renal cell carcinoma can produce more EPO and that erythropoietin drives the bone marrow, overdrives it to produce too, many, too much haemoglobin. If you're actually taking EPO because you've got chronic kidney disease or you're taking it because you're an aspiring athlete and uh, you're blood doping, that can also be done at um, over amounts or excessive amounts of doping and then that will produce a higher than adequate um, haemoglobin. If you're a smoker with or without COPD, which is another cause, the smoke, uh, smoking or the impaired oxygen exchange in the lung due to COPD chronically, both impair oxygen exchange or impair the actual haemoglobin with carbon monoxide binding to haemoglobin, rendering it useless. In those situations, the signal is then sent to the bone marrow to say, we don't have enough oxygen ca carrying capacity here, can you produce more red cells? And that's a physiological response to a disease state. If you stop smoking or you improve your COPD, sometimes that, er that uh, polycythemia will improve. And finally, those that live um, in high altitude or those that undergo high elevation training will naturally physiologically have a higher uh, amount of haemoglobin and that's usually an okay thing. Hemolysis is the destruction of red cells. And this um, could be for a variety of reasons. We talked before about microangiopathic. You can have mechanical shredding for um, the older style mechanical heart valves. And you can also have autoimmune destruction through a variety of means. When this happens, the red cell is literally torn apart, uh, either through immune mediation or physical means. And that releases a number of things that we can track that are evidence of hemolysis. So we see whenever any cell dies or there's high cell turnover, there is lactase dehydrogenase being released, LDH is released, that then um, you could measure. That's a very um, non-specific measure because any cell can release that. Naturally, destruction of red cells will cause anemia. Again, not very specific to hemolysis. But the things that are more specific, you can test free hemoglobin. So that's hemoglobin that's not inside a red cell. This, this hemoglobin that we're testing usually is red cell hemoglobin. Then. Haptoglobin is a protein that's produced by the liver. That protein is actually designed to go and mop up free haemoglobin because free haemoglobin can be damaging to tissues in the, in the body. So when that gets bound to free haemoglobin, it gets out of circulation, I believe, by the renal excretion, and so the haptoglobin levels will drop. So in significant hemolysis, the haptoglobin should be undetectable. The liver produces it, so people who have liver disease usually have low but still detectable levels of haptoglobin, and that can be a bit trickier to diagnose hemolysis in those patients. Finally, bilirubin is released as a, a, a breakdown product of the heme part. So we talked about the haemoglobin and the heme molecules within the actual subunits get released and they break down into bilirubin and the bilirubin rises there and we see that and that again is a bit more of a sensitive marker. All of these things usually help cause in tandem, particularly if you've got intravascular hemolysis. How can we work out is this immune mediated or not? and we can do a direct anti-globulin test or DAT test. And this previously used to be called Coombs test, if you've ever heard of that. The DAT test enables us to test whether there are antibodies or complement that are attacking red cells. And therefore, we, that would lead us down the path of autoimmune hemolysis. However, if it's microangiopathic or related to some physical means, there won't be that immune activity and the DAT will be therefore negative. Let's move on to platelets. When we have low platelets, we have thrombocytopenia. Thrombo meaning platelets, cyto meaning cells, penia in the blood, low platelets in the blood. There's a huge amount of causes where I've listed there, but the main thing I want you to consider is to say, is this due to the bone marrow being suppressed or disease of the, of the bone marrow itself? We call them bone marrow causes, either primary because of disease, or is it secondary suppression of the bone marrow through medications, sepsis, inflammatory states and the like, or is there peripheral destruction or consumption occurring? And that can happen in conditions like immune thrombocytopenia purpura, where there's antibody mediated destruction of platelets, or thrombotic uh, thrombocytopenia purpura, which is where there's um, consumption of the, of the platelets as they're triggered to cause an inappropriate amount of clotting.
disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, DIC, again, there's a trigger to, to set off a whole cascade of clotting and the platelets drop because they're being used and they're not being produced fast enough. There can be other causes, chronic liver disease, where they are consumed in the spleen and any cause of hypersplenism or the large spleen will often produce a, a thrombocytopenia, as well as a variety of drugs that may directly damage the bone marrow and therefore production, directly kill platelets, or more commonly, trigger the immune system to target um, those platelets. And we call that a drug-induced thrombocytopenia purpura, or DITP. If you're dealing with thrombocytopenia, one of the really helpful tests is called immature platelet fraction. This is what reticulocytes are to red cells. You can use an IPF to show you, is the bone marrow appropriately responding to this drop in platelets? So if someone acutely drops their platelets, the bone marrow should get triggered to produce more platelets and therefore the IPF will rise and that we see that as an appropriate elevation. If you've got someone that's dropped their platelet count, but their IPF is normal, that is suggesting that the bone marrow is not responding to the need for platelets and maybe the issue of the drop of plates is at least in part due to the bone marrow having some kind of suppression or disease process that's there. But if they're being consumed or they're being destroyed in the spleen or other parts of the body, the IPF will be elevated. So we see that in immune thrombocytopenia purpura, antibody mediated destruction of platelets, we see the IPF is raised because the bone marrow, which is healthy, is producing more uh, platelets to, con to compensate. Thrombocytosis is a lot simpler. There's really primary and secondary. Primary being essential thrombocytosis, again, a condition where a genetic defect that's usually acquired, which is typically this JAK2 mutation, drives the bone marrow to produce a lot more platelets. And we see numbers, the usual range is 150 to 450 in a normal person. People with ET usually climb well above 700, and we see people even rising above 1,000, even up to 2,000. At those levels, we give them aspirin because the amount of platelets sometimes causes inappropriate um, clot formation. Secondary causes are inflammatory. So platelets themselves are an acute phase reactant. So you know, in an inflammatory condition, they will be um, triggered to produce more. And you can actually, like there can be EPO, there is a TPO, a thrombopoietin, usually produced by the liver. Um, and in some conditions, we can actually give an, a synthetic TPO that then triggers extra production of platelets. So if you're on that treatment, and you're being given inappropriate amounts of the drug, you'll have a, a thrombocytosis. Pancytopenia is where all three cell lines are affected on the CBE. The red cells or hemoglobin, the white cells and the platelets, so all three of them. When you've got two, you can call that a bicytopenia, but pan meaning all the way through. Whenever you see this, you need to first suspect, is there bone marrow failure? Because there's not that many other causes that will actually cause that degree of disease. And we think about bone marrow infiltration, so the diseases that affect the bone marrow by taking over the space. So myeloma, myelofibrosis, leukemia in particular needs to be first in your mind. And then some forms of lymphoma will invade the bone marrow. Still treatable. You can have bone marrow aplasia. That's where there's a lack of tissue in the bone marrow. And there commonly can be aplastic anemia, which is often triggered by a parvovirus. And you can have immune-mediated immune aplasia of the bone marrow as well. And some, a lot of chemotherapy agents and other targeted therapies used in autoimmune or cancer treatment can suppress the bone marrow. And you will, if you did a bone marrow then, you would see that there's less cells there and therefore not able to produce as much. And myelodysplasia that we met, mentioned before, a kind of pre-malignant condition usually associated with age where you have a dysfunction of the bone marrow, it can't produce its usual amount of cells. If you've got a really severe nutritional deficiency, vitamin B12 or folate, that initially starts as an anemia and for B12 often then progresses to a peripheral neuropathy. Um, and then if that continues on, you can get a, a really pancytopenia type picture, but it's quite rare to see that in, in um, first world nations. Lastly, um, in rare cases, you can get peripheral destruction of the cells, just like the platelets of the white cells and the red cells being consumed by a very active spleen, although that is uncommon. So I hope that that's been really helpful. We've covered what is on a complete blood examination and what are the features and, and differentials to consider where we talk about high haemoglobin, low haemoglobin, which is anemia, um, and particularly about pancytopenia, high platelet count, and low platelet count. I hope that's been helpful, and thanks for watching.